I'm Tom Smythe from the National Library and Archives Canada. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about whether we really know our data before it's admitted to the Digital Preservation Archive. We've built a new tool for characterization, which we hope will help us assess digital preservation tenability and resource impact before acquisition decisions need to be made. So I'm happy to go through this real quick today. Uh, I'm happy to take questions and to discuss with you afterwards. So, but this will go quick. To start off with, uh, perhaps a, uh, a problem statement. Uh, we all have local digital file format registries or digital file format policies, but uh, do we always assess whether incoming data for potential acquisition conforms or not to the institutional file format policy and before any data is transferred into the organization? As a secondary question, uh, maybe how do we manage limited operational capacity for digital curation and preservation in the midst of mounting internal client demand? As some key points of departure, uh, we had known for some time that non-compliant data, of course, minimally impacts digital preservation efficiency, may impact our uh, digital preservation tenability, and possibly also the organization's mandate in terms of our ability to make any particular data set uh, publicly accessible, where that may be problematic and wasn't known before the data was accepted. Uh, to address some of these issues, we are experimenting with a digital preservation service catalog, which will have sort of a similar approach to an IT service catalog that will help define uh, what it is we do. It will also, in terms of service levels, will help us define degrees of digital preservation effort, will assess digital preservation overall efficiency, and will assist in planning and communicating about total available capacity to do digital preservation and curation, uh, let's say by fiscal year. All of this work actually uh, derives from our attempts to install PayMoss. So what is, what is PayMoss? Uh, ISO 2652 is a partner standard to OAIS, and probably a lot of organizations do PayMoss because it's effectively just a memorandum of agreement between the digital preservation archive or the organization and a client, which details uh, how that acquisition or that data set will, will be managed. Uh, it'll, It'll cover things like the, the, the pre-transfer procedures, uh, exactly what is being acquired, uh, the legal details in terms of use for that data. And it really is your, your, your first statement of what your cost of ownership and your risks are going to be inherent to acquiring that particular data set. So, uh, but when you're assessing these details at the point of pre-transfer for a potential acquisition, what happens when junk data is found? Does this impact what we agree as an organization to acquire? Does it have consequent impact on the PayMoss agreement? Now we know that Droid can be run on pre-transfer data, but does that report actually get compared manually or otherwise to the file format policy? And what does the output, what are the findings and how do those impact digital preservation capacity management? Put another way, uh, are the degree of data and digital preservation tenability, the financial costs of ownership, the risks, and the capacity impact, are these fully known and accepted before the data enters the organization? Now, our we know that it should, but our answers to these questions practically were no or never, and so we know that change was needed. A uh, couple extra key questions in terms of uh, whether and how do we get clients to understand the costs and risks of bit level only preservation? Uh, how do we have these conversations with clients in terms of informing them that not all data is in fact manageable? Is it all archival? Or it can be made accessible or it may be tenable? Uh, and another question, a key one for this purpose is do we even have a means to assess any of this? So we knew we wanted to, to create some new means. Uh, the first step is, of course, to write the file format policy. In so doing, uh, we admitted to ourselves that this is essentially a statement of the institution's capacity to manage, migrate, and serve data formats. Uh, the degree of effort and duration that's needed to manage this incoming data could be defined in part by its compliance or not with the file format policy. Step one for us was therefore to reassess our total file format management capability from scratch, by all means available, automated and manual. And for the first time, we recorded this in an SQL database so that we could query it instead of trying to manage it on a written document. 
Now, next step was to get into this file format policy, this local digital file format registry database, and to install categories of sliding complexity by pronom ID. So the first and most optimal category is material that is preferred because it's in a, currently in an already, ex, uh, already stable file format. Uh, a next category would be material mm -hmm. that is in a not a, a file format that is not preferred, but could be automa auto automatically migrated to one that is preferred. And then you get into uh, the, the sliding scale of, of extra effort, which could involve intervention by a human, uh, potential R&D to produce a strategy to manage that file format internally. Perhaps it needs ONM, or perhaps it's just technically problematic for us at LAC. So this is a caution, this pr prompts further investigation. Uh, other file formats uh, might actually not even be a container for documentary heritage, in which case they are ineligible for digital preservation treatment. Uh, another category would be formats that we know we need to avoid, either because they're proprietary, proprietary or they generate untenable cost or risk for us in the current state. Uh, in terms of digital preservation service catalog, each one of these would have a service level assigned and therefore would also have a FTE time and ONM co commitment involved in doing that work. This helps us to begin building a service catalog that helps us calculate total capacity. In terms of our vision for this new tool, uh, we didn't have an automated means of comparing the, the file format policy to a, a data set for potential acquisition in real time. And we rarely had the time to do this manually before an acquisition decision had to be made. We therefore didn't have real figures with which to brief our clients and give strategic advice in terms of how compliant or not a, a given data set was against the file format policy. And we didn't have objective data with which to advise uh, how PayMoss agreements should change. Uh, and therefore we knew that we needed to build a tool that would help us with this. So how does this tool work? The subject of this talk. Uh, at the point of pre-transfer or pre-ingest, Digital Archive staff would run Droid on all incoming data for potential acquisition. This Droid output report would be dropped into a network location. Uh, the LDFR tool, which is a script and PowerShell, uh, credit to Maxim Camp, uh, Champagne for building this tool, which is fabulous. Uh, it then compares the, the Droid report to the LDFR database and outputs a new report. This new report then speaks to how compliant the data set is against all of these categories in our LDFR by pronoun ID. Uh, in the interest of time, this will be just a, a quick couple of screenshots, but actual reports are available if interested. Uh, so what this would, this script would do is it would, this tool, it would arrange the, the data set for potential acquisition into these categories with real file counts. You'd then get a breakdown of each individual file type by pronoun ID into the categories that shows you what you're really dealing with. So preferred, acceptable, tolerable, because it requires manual migration. And then there's other categories, for example, not eligible for digital preservation, which is things like system files, assessment required and cannot assess either because they don't have, they have, we haven't encountered them yet in our work or because they don't have file suffixes or they don't have detectable pronoun IDs. This is a second version of the report, which is condensed and is used for briefing the client. You can see there's a pie graph here that breaks down at a glance exactly how that data conforms to the file format policy or is otherwise uh, requiring elevated effort, which in turn speaks to a higher level of service uh, for the digital preservation catalog, which in turn impacts capacity. So these two output LDFR reports are used to brief and provide strategic advice to clients in terms of the total cost of ownership, how much work is going to be involved in, in processing that particular data set, uh, and, and it can do all of this before acquisition decisions are made. And these are instrumental to influencing PayMoss agreements on what and, and, and advising on what data can and should be acquired before that transfer is initiated. Now, this also helps us to do prioritization of projects and capacity planning because the LDFR tool will output an estimate in terms of how much capacity will be absorbed by each individual data set, which, as I said, speaks to digital preservation catalog service levels and how our, our, our overall time as a digital preservation area is spent by fiscal year. So the management, the clients, and the digital preservation area can, can meet and agree together how, the, how our capacity will be spent. Uh, and indeed, if capacity is exceeded, which is often, the report can help us with real data and real statistics to brief the management 
and to request uh, and produce arguments, business cases for additional resources. So overall, uh, the point of all this is that we really weren't assessing uh, sustainability. We weren't assessing preservation tenability or estimating the cost of ownership or what the risks or elevated effort were for any particular data set before it was acquired. But now we can do so because we have deployed this tool operationally in the area that's responsible for pre-ingest. Uh, this approach uh, enables uh, much better efficiency for pre-transfer and pre-acquisition. It improves those conditions, leading to overall digital preservation efficiency, capacity to do more work, yay, and ensures that uh, we have much better data quality of life flowing in, which uh, results in greater efficiency and less work uh, for us and, and for the longevity of the, of the library and archival collections. This uh, also provides us with hard numbers with which to prove, discuss, plan, control, digital preservation areas, effort, and capacity against current resourcing levels and uh, with escalating demand, leading to data-driven arguments for greater resourcing. So I hope this is of interest. Um, I'm very happy to take questions or comments uh, uh, and, and, and cheers. I appreciate your time. Have a great iPress.